great. Thank you, Karen. Um, and uh, is David still here? No. No. The other David, David Orr. Well, that was actually a perfect setup. Thank you so much for, for doing that because now I don't have to talk at all about why climate change is important. And this talk has, like everyone else's, has been changed over the week because uh, so many of the themes that we've been talking about, I think, are going to come together in some of my recent research. So um, my research really is looking at how does, and what I'm going to do is talk about, first of all, is how does the American public perceive climate change right now? And we all recognize why the American public is really critical. Okay? The United States, with only 5% of the world's population, produces about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gases. Okay? And so our individual consumer behavior and the polit politicians and policies that we support are pretty critical to solving this problem. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about, though, is then look at the global scale of how does the world public, from what we know right now, think about the environment? What kinds of environmental values out there are out there? Okay? So I'll just get started. So within my own field of risk, field of risk perception and decision making, uh, we've long had this focus really on how people make rational decisions. And just in the past 10 years has been this explosion of interest in what the depth psychologists here would call the unconscious, what we would call the role of emotion and affect and imagery. And this is, on the other hand, is an old standing problem. This is a wonderful quote uh, by Osgood. Of all the imps that inhabit the nervous system, that little black box in psychological theorizing, the one we call meaning is held by common consent to be the most elusive. Yet again, by common consent of social scientists, this variable is one of the most important determinants of human <coughs> behavior. And that's one of the things I'm really fascinated with, is meaning, but a particular kind of meaning, not denotative meaning, as in dictionary definitions. If I say, what, does, you know, what is radiation? Okay? How many of you are going to be able to immediately give me the exact dictionary definition of it? But when I say, what comes to mind when you think of radiation? You have all sorts of images that come to mind, right? And it's those images and those feelings associated with those images that ultimately and usually drive our perception and decision making. And I'll give you a good example of this. So uh, I'm going to report here on a national study I did in 2003, uh, all focused on climate change, um, a random survey of Americans. And one of the things we did is we asked them, what's the first thought or image that comes to your mind when you think of global warming. Okay? And go ahead and just think of that. And then we asked, whatever that image is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So on a scale of negative three, meaning very, very bad, and plus three being very, very good, is that image that's brought up, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Because it's those two things. It's the image and the feeling associated with that image that are important. So what did we find? American images of global warming. We then take all those images, we content analyze them, and we loop and group them into common themes. And what this allows us to do is to see the distribution and range of meaning in a broad public. And so the first thing that comes to most people's minds when they think of global warming is melting ice. Okay? Glaciers melting, the Arctic without ice, uh, Antarctic melting, and you know, we've had lots of media stories that, that get to this. The second most common image that comes to people's mind is just heat. Okay? And that's often just an association with the word warming in global warming. Global warming, hot. Okay? The third set of images impacts on the natural world, okay? on ecosystems and particular species. Then come references, unfortunately, to the ozone hole. And this is something that we have found over and over and over again is that the public, many people within the public, basically think that global climate change and the ozone hole are the same problem. Okay? And there's, a under, there's an underlying mental model or metaphorical reason why. It's because the ozone hole, this wonderful, awful, but wonderful metaphor, carries with it the message that something is wrong. If you have a protective shield, a protective layer with a hole in it, like in your roof, you know that there's a problem. You need to fix that. Okay? The metaphor carries with it the impulse that you need to do something. Global warming. What do I do with that? Climate change. Oh, God, that's even more ambiguous. But at the same time people learned about the ozone hole and that problem, they also heard about the greenhouse effect. Okay? And I have found this even in senior environmental studies students who still get this wrong. 
they, people then put those two metaphors together and think, oh, the reason we have global warming is because there's a hole in the greenhouse. And therefore, that means either there's more solar radiation coming in and warming up the planet, or some people think, oh, a hole, that means that the, the warmth is going to escape out the hole and it's going to cool off the planet. Okay? This is logical, it's rational, it makes sense, it's just wrong. Okay. The next set of images that people come up with uh, are images what I call alarmists here. And these are intense images of apocalypse, catastrophe, disaster. And we'll come back to that. Then finally, probably the most concrete images are flooding and sea level rise. Then come references to just climate change, you know, seasons changing or climate change itself. And then last is this group of naysayers. Um, and so what I want to point out here is that of, this is about 65% of all responses, are responses to a problem that's far away, okay? This may be serious and may be a good warning sign, but I don't live in the Arctic. Okay? I don't depend, or at least knowingly depend, on glaciers and so on. And so even though that's a powerful image in some ways, it's not a very powerful image. That doesn't affect me. Um, heat tend to be very generalized, abstract. Nature, again, most of us, I mean, there are those of us who will get concerned about something because it affects nature, but again, how does that affect me and my family? And then confusion with a different issue. Okay? One of the most important things, however, is what we did not find. We found no associations to the impacts on human health. Yet, that's exactly what some of the most important impacts are going to be. Okay? And so that means that message has not gotten out there. OK, so now I'm going to focus in on the alarmists and these naysayers. How many people did you, what was your data? Uh, 673 people um, randomly selected across the country. And this has been duplicated on another one for national surveys. What year? 2003. I mean, it would be interesting to do it again now. Post Katrina. I think there have been, and, and a few other things. That's right. No, absolutely. And well, I'll get into that, but I don't want to get sidetracked. OK, so there are these two interpretive, what I'm developing is this concept called interpretive communities, and that there are groups of people who are predisposed to interpret the world in particular kinds of ways, with different kinds of values and different kinds of worldviews. And I want to focus in. First was the alarmists, and they have these incredible images of disaster again. But I really want to focus in on the naysayers. Okay? These are people who have several different kinds of responses. Flat denials. There is no global warming. It's natural. Something's been going on for a long time. Doubting the science. Okay? I just don't believe the data can support it. Doubt based on personal experience. One of my favorites was you know, global warming. It was minus 30 here last night. It can't possibly be warming. Um, media hype. And my favorite are the conspiracy theorists, scientists making up statistics for their job security. OK. So how does that play out? Here is, I know it's a graph, and I'll just lead you through it. Low risk at this end, high risk at this end. And what I've done is taken these two groups. Here are the naysayers, and here are the alarmists with these apocalyptic visions. And here is all the rest of the public. Okay. These are all different kinds of questions about how severe of a risk do you think climate change is. But the main point here is that you can see just how out of step naysayers are with the rest of the country. Okay? Yes, alarmists see more risk than everybody else, but everybody else in the country is much closer to this position than they are to this position. Likewise, when you look at policy support, and this is also just important, um, you know, the naysayers, again, radically different, and that's not a surprising. They don't think it's a problem. Um, but, you know, there is very strong support that the United States should act on climate change regardless of what other countries do. The U.S. should reduce its emissions um, on its own. Great support for the Kyoto Protocol, okay? People don't often realize this. There is great public support for the Kyoto Protocol, though not in the halls of Congress. Great support for increasing fuel efficiency standards, regulating CO2 but great opposition to gas taxes or business energy taxes. Okay? So Americans want people to do something, but they're not convinced that I'm going to sacrifice to do it. But what was really interesting was looking at the role of values in this. Okay? Because I found that, in particular, egalitarian values, the more egalitarian you are, the more you support and are concerned about climate change. The less egalitarian you are, the less you care about climate change. And so, these group of naysayers disagree 
that the world would be more peaceful if wealth was divided equally among nations. They, they don't support affirmative action. They disagree that the world needs more participatory decision making. Okay? <coughs> they think that we have gone too far pushing equal rights. Okay? You're starting to see there's a worldview here. By contrast, you look at a bunch of individualism kinds of aspects, and they're very high on that. Uh, the government should get out of our way. Um, life sorts out those that try hard from those who don't. The government shouldn't have the right to regulate us, um, etc. cetera, okay? Um, so, so who are these groups, okay? Alarmists tend to be slightly more likely to be women, minorities, and liberal, and that's about it. The naysayers are a very distinct group. Are we alarmists? Mm, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> and I said tend to be. Um, the uh, naysayers are predominantly white, male, conservative, Republican, Christian, and they primarily get their news from? Fox. Everybody says that, but no. Radio. radio. Talk radio. Okay, and I have with you know, tongue in cheek say this is the Rush Limbaugh effect. Okay. And it relates to trust. And I've mentioned trust several times in this conference, but the naysayers are more likely to trust corporations. They very much distrust media. They very much distrust environmental organizations. They're less likely to trust scientists and doctors, and they're even less likely to trust their own family and friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm beginning to see the character structure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this points out that messenger is as important as message. Okay? If you're an environmentalist, it, you are, you're actually making it worse trying to talk to these people about climate change. Okay? They will not listen to you. And so this is an important point I just want to make, is that who delivers the message is at least as important, if not more important in some ways, than the message you're actually delivering. Okay, this now is showing something else that I want to talk about, back to meaning. What you're seeing here is the whole public in the black versus I did a, a survey of climate change activists at the World Climate Summit in uh, year 2000 at The Hague. Okay, I participated in that summit and I was able to survey 112 climate change activists. Okay, And not surprisingly, when you look at their images, the images they provide about global warming, they also provided images of disaster and flooding and melting sea ice, but their negative feelings associated with those images are much stronger. Okay? And that's not surprising. These are activists. They, they think this is a, a truly global problem that needs to be done, dealt with. And interestingly, the term global warming and the term climate change are seen as equally bad. But when you look at the public, these two terms have very different kinds of negative feelings associated with them. Global warming is bad, climate change is not so bad. And this has already been exploited for political gain. Okay? In, uh, there was a leaked memo from uh, a strategist by the name of Frank Luntz, who's a Republican pollster and strategist, who sent a memo to the White House in I think the year 2001 entitled How to Win the Environmental Communications Battle. And he lays out this whole strategy based on his research. And of that, he talks about climate change. He said, it is time for us to start talking about climate change instead of global warming. Climate change is less frightening than global warming. As one focus group participant noted, climate change sounds like you're going from Pittsburgh to Fort Lauderdale. While global warming has catastrophic connotations attached to it, climate change suggests a more controllable and less emotional challenge. The New York Times went back looked at Bush's speeches before he got this memo and after he got this memo. Before he got this memo, he used the term global warming. Afterwards, it's been nothing but climate change to the extent that he talks about it at all. Okay? Words have power. And I would also like to point out that scientists have their own reasons. They don't like using the word global warming. They've st instead chosen to use the term climate change, and that's fine. Let's use that term amongst ourselves. But you have to know that when you use the term climate change, in a public context, your words invariably enter this rich, complex, socio-political context in which you are, however intentionally, helping one side versus another. Okay. Yet, connotation is malleable. I mean, the point is, is that for activists, these two terms are basically synonymous. And so it's possible that if we keep talking about climate change and people begin to associate that term, it will change. But there's now and 
future. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and report a bit on a study that I've just finished over the past three years with my friends Bob Cates and Tom Paris. And a lot of people working in sustainability have focused on technology and sustainability or institutions and governance and sustainability, you know, all these basic kinds of things. Um, but everybody kind of recognizes that human values and attitudes are pretty key. But nobody really has had any sense of how do we even think about this yet. So we did a three-year project on trying to assess global <coughs> public values and attitudes based on the limited, it's only about a dozen multinational scale surveys that have been done. Uh, we've had three different publications um, come out and I'm happy to uh, share them with anyone that wants them. Actually, that one's posted on the workshop web. Yeah, this one's on the, on the workshop. And I won't go too much into it, but we looked at declaratory <coughs> statements of values that have been put out by major institutions, including the Earth Charter, the Johannesburg Declaration, the UN Millennium Declaration, et cetera. And then we looked at public values and attitudes regarding a wide range of things, of which I'm not going to talk about most. I'm really going to focus just on the environmental stuff. But we looked at attitudes towards freedom and democracy, capitalism, globalization, et cetera. Okay? Just to tweak your interest, perhaps. Okay. Percent of the global public calling environmental issues a very serious problem, the highest, most extreme category. 72% say that water pollution is a very serious problem. And basically what you see here is that for water pollution, rainforest, natural resource depletion, air pollution, ozone layer, species loss, then climate change and GMO food, people are very concerned. Okay? And this is hopeful. Okay. Climate change less than these, and so we can be concerned about that perhaps, but even there it's 56% choose the most extreme value. Okay. And this is a study of 39 different countries, all continents, very different cultures, etc. All right, now let's get to the U.S. environmental values. This is again a national survey that I conducted. And um, what you see here is the gray is people that somewhat agree with this statement, and then green is who strongly agree with this statement. Okay? Humans are not part of nature. Only about 10% agree with that statement. Humans have the right to subdue and control nature. Only 27% agree with that. Okay? Only about 48% agree that humankind was created to rule over nature, and there's that Judeo-Christian uh, part in particular. Humans should adapt to nature rather than modify it to suit them. 76% agree. Humans have moral duties and obligations to non-living nature, to plants and trees, and to other animals, up in the 85 to 88% agreement, and getting stronger agreement. Nature has value within itself, regardless of any value humans place on it. About 98% agree with that. The vast majority strongly agree. Okay? I, read, I saw these, and I just went, wow. I did not expect that. I'll take questions at the end. I'm just going to ask, what are the trends here? Uh, what are the trends? I don't have, to, uh, this is a one survey, I, and no one else has replicated it in quite this way. Okay. How about at the international level? The human nature relationship. Which of these statements comes closer to your own views? Human beings should master nature, or human beings should coexist with nature? Green, coexist. Gray, master nature. What do you see here? A sea of green. Overwhelming, 98% of Japanese say we should coexist. 98%. Do you know how many questions you can put on a survey where you get 98%? Okay. Sweden, Puerto Rico, South Africa, or South Korea, Chile, Canada, uh, Argentina. Here's the United States. Again, probably around 80%. Mexico, Bangladesh, India. Zimbabwe, South Africa, China, about probably 60%. And it's not until you get down to the Philippines and Vietnam that you start seeing larger levels saying we should master nature. Okay? Now this suggests that people have basically accepted on the abstract value level the idea of a kind of an ecocentric perspective. All right. So, great, right? Hey, wonderful. We got the right values. How come we're treating the world like crap? Okay, why is that? 
So we've got obviously this huge gap between our values on the one hand and our behavior on the other. And so we've said that there's at least three major reasons why that is. Sometimes it's the direction, the strength, and particularly the priority of values and attitudes. We may all say, yes, we need to protect the earth, but do we prioritize that value over, well, Kathleen did it for us yesterday with a wonderful essay of talking about, you know, we want our children to go to have education, yet we invest in corporations that, mer that manufacture death, right? We have competing values, and the fact is that environmental values are not priorities. Gallup did a st study uh, a few years ago in which they found of 10 national issues, the environment comes in 10th. And this happens on every time. Environment is always at the bottom, well below unemployment, you know, terrorism, uh, health care, etc. And even within the environmental category, global warming tends to be at the bottom compared to, say, air pollution, water pollution, things like that. Okay? So it's about priority. It's not about creating the value. People want to do the right thing, but it's not a priority. Secondly, are individual barriers. Okay? People need time. They often need money to do these things. I mean, you can't buy organic food if it costs more sometimes. You need the knowledge. Okay? Sometimes you just don't even know what the right thing to do is. Sometimes you need power. You need the ability to, to do the thing that you think is right. Perceived efficacy is really important. You know, if you don't think that what you're going to do is going to make a difference, then why do it? And habit. You know, we cannot underestimate the power of habit. And then there are structural barriers. Laws, regulations, perverse subsidies, infrastructure. You know, you may want to use light rail to travel from one city to another, but if it isn't there, you can't do it. Okay? And economic and political contexts, things like the price of oil, has huge implications for the way people behave. You increase prices and suddenly people want to go out and buy fuel efficient cars. We're seeing that now. Okay. So to summarize and conclude, the American public does perceive climate change as a threat. They do support action, but there's little sense of urgency or priority. Yet, as we're also pointing out, and I think as David really did a nice job of showing us in his talk, this role of the unconscious, the role of meaning, of affect and imagery are critical. That's why advertising works. Different interpretive communities require different values, messages, and messengers. And we've been talking about this idea throughout the week. The global public perceives environmental issues as very serious and seems to embrace an ecocentric leaning ethic, but again, it's not a priority. And there are a range of individual and structural barriers standing between our values and our behaviors. So I'll end with that. Thanks.